Exactly 2.15. <laughs> Our next speaker is Donna Benjamin from Catalyst IT, and her talk is, I am your user, why do you hate me? Please put your hands together for Donna. I am your user. Why do you hate me? Free and open source software suffers from poor usability. Did I just say that out loud at Linux Conf AU? <laughs> but it's true. Free and open source software does suffer from poor usability. And Leslie Hawthorne and I have been ranting about this to each other in private for many years. I'm Donna Benjamin. Uh, as Rowan said, I'm currently working at Catalyst IT, an awesome company dedicated to providing free and open source software solutions to companies and organizations of all sorts. Um, I first met Leslie Hawthorne um, at LCA 2007. Uh, now she's at Red Hat these days, and uh, we've been having this sort of private rant for some time, and we decided to finally take it public. When we did uh, sit down to start writing this talk, we kind of said, now, what were we talking about again? There may have been alcohol involved. I couldn't possibly confirm or deny that. However, it kind of came out of our combined experience being involved in the open source community and A, using free and open source software and at times struggling with it. And B, hearing our developer friends talk about users with contempt. So that's sort of where it came from. But what do we mean when we talk about users? Now, I'm sure we've all got a kind of, oh, I know what that means, sort of quick and dirty answer in our heads. But let's just stop for a minute and really have a look. This is what Wikipedia reckons. Now, you'll note there that I've highlighted that a user lacks technical expertise. And we go on to talk about power users not being capable of programming or system administration. We are defining a user by what they are not, what they can't do, what they can't understand. We are making some assumptions about them when we do this. Now, Wikipedia, bless it, also has a disambiguation page for the word user, and there are other kinds of users that it, that it talks about, other sort of uh, technical fields where it also talks about it. And, and really, um, when you think about it, when you go into the sort of deep and dirty thinking about what is a user and think about who else refers to their customers, clients, citizens, etc., as a user, it's basically computing and drug dealers. <laughs> mm. That's interesting. Drug dealers. Well, you know, this is open source, right? The first hit is free. Is that how that works? <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. So, yeah, user. They're also, you know, often represented like this, but more about that later. So, how do I hate thee? Let me count the ways. Riffing a little bit on Elizabeth Barrett Browning there. Um, how do I hate thee? Let me count the ways. So, this comes back to the rant. When, when Leslie and I started uh, talking about this to each other, we kind of really, we tried to unpack what it was. Why were we feeling this? Why were we being made to feel stupid when we used free software? Why were our colleagues talking about users with such contempt? We wanted to really understand what that was about. Were we really, were we just making it up? Like maybe this was just our perception and it wasn't real. We talked to other people and they went, no, no, yeah, no, there's a thing. Like, I started by saying we suffer from poor usability and I think many people agreed. So, why? Well, we came up with a few. And we've talked about this one. Pia very nicely reframed the, the classic here, which is a lot of free software is just made by me for me. I don't really care about 
its usability because it does what I need. Now, if you want to use it and do awesome stuff with it, great, go for it, more power to you. Patches, welcome. I may not you know, do anything with them, but really it's just for brainiac me. The only person who needs to know how to use it from my perspective is me because I wrote it for me, right? Scratching your own itch. Fine. Then there's this kind of prevalent, pervasive meme about the stupid user. Stupid users. I mean, hands up if you've seen something like this before. Hands up if you've read about those hilarious stories about users using, you know, their CD tray as a cup holder and, <laughs> right? There are just so many of these things. But what are we really saying here? You know, we, we kind of accept this, we laugh about it, we joke about it, but we're calling our users stupid. And that's not, that's not really all that helpful. This one I just came across recently, it's from a book called Search Patterns, um, talking about the way uh, users actually approach search, and there are different behaviours and stuff, and it just, it just really jumped out at me because I was prepping for this talk. Most of the complaints we get are due to the way users search. They use the wrong keywords. Yeah, that's right, it's those stupid users. Those stupid users yet again. So this is common, we, it's a shorthand. Yeah, yeah, stupid users. Yeah, so what do we do? One of the other things is we think we know better. Our users might ask for things, but no, 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 we know they really don't want that. They don't know what they want, they can't express it to us, no, no, no. No, no, I know better. Who's, had, who's encountered this professionally, that you might be talking about a, a backlog of work to do and you know, a few hands went up? Is it frustrating? Or do we just sort of go, yeah, no, they, they don't really need these things. Or we don't have time to do these things. And we think this thing is more important. So, no, no. I love that picture. And this one, this one I get particularly frustrated with, that we kind of assume our users can't do stuff because they're just not technical. This really wasn't designed for them. They're not technical. They can't understand. You're just not technical. Who's, who's ever been told that? Does it make you feel awesome? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does make you feel awesome. So you're just not technical. I mean, what does that really mean? Do you need to know exactly how a car works to drive it? I mean, what does your just not technical mean in this context? I think this is one of those, another one of those kind of throwaway lines that we use to, I don't know if it's to justify or to explain or to hide, but it's one that I find a little bit frustrating. Okay, so you're just not technical. And I sort of had the, we had the icon up first, but I think part of the problem is that we often talk about users as an abstract, and that we use these faceless icons to represent them in architecture and diagrams, that they're not really people. They're not us, users, they're other. Does that sort of seem familiar to some of you? They're just kind of not really, not the kind of human beings, not sitting down with Russell and seeing how he's using his computer, it's just this user. Yeah, faceless icons, candy-coloured representations of human beings, not real human beings. And then there's this one, I think, ooh, I'm not sure this goes really to the heart of usability so much, or, but really about a broader sense of our community and how we treat people, that somehow we take pride in having prickly attitudes in some of our projects that you've got to have a thick skin to really, you know, be able to get through all of the stuff to be able to contribute back to that project. Prickly attitudes. But users can be whiny, entitled and demanding. As we had Nadia's keynote this morning, there are a lot more of them than there are of us and they can be incredibly entitled and opinionated and not very helpful and not very polite. Neither Leslie or I are advocating for these kinds of people. There is another definition of user and we talk about them as the kind of people we don't want as friends quite often. You know, if that person is a user, there is an exploitative element to the relationship. We acknowledge that, 
take that on board absolutely and very categorically say, we're not talking about that kind of person when we're kind of raising this discussion. But that said, and I think Nadia also touched on this, why are they whiny, entitled and demanding? And they should have been in Lana's talk, which was just on, and maybe they could help themselves better if they, you know, read our fabulous manual. Uh, if they helped themselves, if they uh, organised amongst themselves to support each other. You know, this selfishness is born, I think, often out of frustration, let's face it. How often have you perhaps encountered some rough edge of a software tool of one kind or another and perhaps said words that your mother would not have been very happy with you for saying? Or uh, your father would have looked sternly upon you for using such vulgar language? Um, I think, well, I know I'm certainly guilty of it and I'll swear and cuss and, and say terrible things about the maintainers or creators of that software, but it's come out of frustration. It's come out of, I don't know how to do the thing that I'm trying to do. Is that common or is that just me? Some nods, some hands, yes, okay. So that's not what we're sort of talking about, but perhaps we can empathise a little bit about where that's coming from. Let's face it, we, we don't always make it easy for users to help themselves. We might send them off to find a manual that was wonderful five years ago but now doesn't apply or doesn't exist at all because, hey, it's self-documenting code, right? Just read the code. Some of us do, actually, and go and figure out, why isn't this work? Oh, right. It doesn't do what I think it should do, so documentation would help. And not just as a way of stopping users from asking questions, but also as a way for them to get on their way and do the thing they came to do. Help them, guide them, give them guide rails. Make it easier. We could do better here as well. So let's just pause for a moment and chat about chat. Who's familiar with this icon? Slack, the IRC killer. No. <laughs> IRC, IRC has been with us for over 30 years. And it's awesome and I think it's a real key to um, a lot of the success and, and, and wonder of the open source community and that we've been able to connect with other communities, you know, get out of our ponds and use IRC and it's great. Um, but it's not necessarily a particularly usable tool um, by modern standards. And Slack have come along and made it really, really breathtakingly easy and also delightful. They've stepped in and given you little helpful hints as you start to use Slack. And a number of open source projects started to use Slack and copped a fair amount of flack for doing so. It's not an open tool, it's not free and open source. Slack will own your data and pay, make you pay for the privilege to get your logs and all kinds of badness that we generally don't ascribe to. And yet, there is still this relentless march towards using Slack. Now, I wrote this talk with Leslie, and this is her story uh, about Slack, that she was starting a new program at Red Hat, and she had an intern, all shiny-eyed and fresh-faced and ready to do good in the world, and had given that intern a task of um, developing some kind of uh, uh, resourcing for a particular community that she was working with. And the intern went away, wrote a fantastic report, came back with a strategy, yada, 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 a really good strategy. One of the things in there was to use a chat system, and she suggested Slack. And Leslie said, well, this is an awesome strategy. This is great. It's got all the pieces of the puzzle, but maybe we should use a free and open source software tool instead of Slack. Now, I know IRC can be a bit hard, but let's use IRC Cloud. It's kind of, you know, a compromise somewhere in between. And so that was great. And then, so, and then Leslie stopped and said, wait, but remember, you've, you've, first you've got to sign up for NixServe, and then and she found herself saying, this is, this is complicated. There are steps here that there aren't with Slack. And her intern was like, why can't we just use Slack? Good question, why can't we? Well, for some of the reasons that I sort of mentioned before. But what can we learn from Slack's approach? 
Maybe that's the better question. So, <laughs> I first encountered this awesome steep learning curve, actually in relation to the Drupal community. I went digging, archaeologically digging, and went back, goes a bit, back a bit further to MMORPGs. And um, I don't know about EVE Online, but I know the Drupal community took some joy, some perverse pleasure in being a little bit difficult to use to begin with. It's kind of like some sort of hazing ritual. I don't know. I mean, I love Drupal. Those of you who know me know I'm quite the fanatic about Drupal. But, you know, there's something, there's kind of something wrong when we take pride in it being so much harder than other things. Yes, complicated things are more difficult than simple things, but how do we get, how do we, yeah, let's, so I wanted to riff on this a little bit. <laughs> we talk about things being easy. Now, anything is easy when you know how, right? Once you know how to do it, it's easy. Now, hands up if you're a VI user and it's easy. <laughs> hands up if you run screaming, go help get me out of here if you end up in VI. <laughs> hands up if you've ever had someone sneer at you for your choice of text editor. <laughs> Why do we do that? Hands up if you actually use Emacs. Wow, you people are wizards. Navigate that learning curve. <laughs> well, you know, using it and using it well, yeah, I think that's a, that's a debate for later, Tom. I like that one. I've got one more learning curve slide for you. And that one is Kathy Sierra's. How do you get over the I suck threshold to the I'm awesome threshold at doing the thing I came to do. Now, I said I met Leslie at LCA 2007. Kathy Sierra actually keynoted LCA 2007 in Sydney, and her work is fantastic. She really makes this point, though, how soon can they start kicking ass? When you first start using a new tool, it's a bit like being a toddler first learning to walk. It's hard work, it's frustrating, you're going to have temper tantrums, but at some point you're going to get over there and walking is going to be something you never, you never remember you couldn't do. How do you get over that suck, that suck threshold quickly? How do we, as software creators, help people get over that as quickly as possible? How do we get them to level up to be passionate advocates for our tool? And I would say taking that next step from user to contributor, which is where also Nadia said this morning, we really all want free software people to be. Not users, but contributors. So Kathy says, People don't want to be ba badass at using your tool. The tool is not what they want. They want to be badass at doing whatever that tool allows them to do, right? We often get stuck in thinking about the software. But the software is absolutely irrelevant. I want to, my worst, my worst example is print name badges for a conference in LibreOffice. <laughs> And it was just unbelievably hard compared with using some other proprietary tool someone else had access to. It was like, I am your user, why do you hate me? One of those moments that I then ranted about with Leslie. So they want to be badass at, using your at, at what using your tool allows them to do. Now, Kathy's work has gone from um, a, a blog she wrote regularly um, to a book, and I bought this book, and it is fantastic. This is a plug. You should get it. It's really great. She also talks about ways we learn using examples, um, but this kind of quote really, really stuck out to me as what's important um, in this kind of question. So sort of going back a little bit to kind of trying to uncover some of the reasons why we're in this situation. We really value excellence. We really value perfection. The pursuit of perfection. And sometimes 
I think we focus on that to the detriment of perhaps simplifying things, making it easier. Sometimes that relentless pursuit of perfection isn't such a good thing. Perfect is the enemy of the good. I often tell myself this when I'm fussing over something. It's like, just get on with it, do it. So excellence and quality, when we say, um, when perhaps we reject some contributions because they're not quite up to scratch, perhaps they're some of those little things which ease the way for some of our contributors. I don't know, this is kind of riffing. Is this something where we could afford to be a little bit more accommodating? Could we afford to have a little bit more rough around the edges because it's gonna make it a little easier for people to participate, to contribute, to improve our docs? Perhaps we've got a non-English speaker come to us and their English grammar's not that great, but they wanna help us with, their documenta with our documentation, but we're gonna reject it because their grammar's not perfect. Don't know, is there room? And then there's the cost of all of this. Now, um, Leslie was involved with the Google Summer of Code project. Kat Ullman is here, still runs the fabulous Summer of Code project. And um, a fresh-faced um, uh, awardee, I guess, I don't know, are they awardees, Kat? I don't know. The people who, who get to be Summer of Code students come along and, 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 intro and introduce themselves to open source communities. And this, this young person came along and went, hi, I'm here, I'm a Summer of Code student, it's awesome. And then they went into the IRC channel for that project and they were told to go away. This is a channel for serious developers only, go away. <laughs> Very sad. This, is, this cartoon is written by this woman. Angela Byron. Now, she went on to be the release manager for Drupal 7. That summer of code project was Drupal. Uh, she's gone on to be a very like, well-loved, respected leader in the Drupal community. She went on to become the first woman on the cover of Linux Journal. And we almost scared her away by prickliness by our pursuit of perfection. The risk that we take by not paying attention to our onboarding, our documentation, our helping people get over that suck threshold could be pretty significant. How many people do we, have we lost that we don't know about? She's awesome also, I might be fangirling her just a little bit, so don't tell her. <laughs> Ultimately, I think one of the things that is worth pondering a little more deeply, and other people have pondered this, Genevieve Bell, who keynoted, was it last year? Um, she, she's a, an anthropologist at Intel. She's done a lot of work um, researching into users of technology. And one of the things she found is that there are a lot of women who are early adopters and users of technology. And quite often, they almost become these technology ghettos, which are then prim primarily staffed by women. Think typists, think telegraphists, uh, switchboard operators. You know, this is a thing where women become the primary users of these technologies, and unbeknownst to history and little documented, they drive those technologies forward with their experience of using those technologies. Now imagine if we did the same. Imagine if we treated our users as first class citizens of our projects and not as faceless icons. Imagine if we embraced all of the diversity that they bring, their abilities, their differences, and we listened to them and made it easy for them to contribute, valued their contributions in triage and review and testing, imagine. I think we'd solve our diversity problem really quickly if we could do that. Understand who your users are. See them as people. 
And this is the last thing that I really want to say, and I'd really like you to take away with you today. Oh, that rhymes. Users, can we, can we perhaps stop talking about the people who use our software as users and start thinking about them more as people? We're people creating this software, and it's people who are using our software. We have that in common. We are human beings, and technology is made by and for human beings. And I kind of feel like Nadia's talk this morning was one side of the coin, and mine is sort of the other. We need to think about our maintainers with much more respect and care and empathy. And likewise, we need to think about our users with a whole lot more respect and care and empathy. I don't know why you hate me so much. I'd love to hear more. Perhaps you have other theories. Perhaps there's more we could do. But I hope you agree with me that it doesn't hurt to stop and think and ponder that question. And next time you get a splinter from the rough edges of a piece of software you're using, perhaps you'll pause before being whiny, entitled, and demanding, and expecting the maintainer to just do something about it. But flip side, next time you're working on a piece of software and someone else brings that frustration to the table, you'll be able to wear those shoes, take a moment, and think of that person and what it is they're trying to do and how you might assist them to do it rather than worrying so much about the technology itself. Is that something some of you could do? Yeah? Thank you. I'm, I'm Catacrab on the Twitters and on the IRCs and on all the things. Um, Catacrab, Donna at catacrab.net if you want to email me, but you know, I'm sure that if you have a burning thing to say, please find me and say it. I would love to hear it. But right now you're in the room and you can use this microphone thing. So does anyone have any questions? Paul. G'day. It's a really fascinating con uh, sort of compliment to this morning's talk. Um, and I was wondering, <clears throat> I like your point that you know, we need to sort of personify and individualize the users. Do you think user stories uh, in interfaces have helped? Because sometimes I, I read those stories from some projects and I think this looks more like a myth. This looks like a, a story that the developers have told themselves about a person that doesn't actually exist. What do, you, what do you think of those? So I think that the general move um, in the you know, UX, UI and UX and developing personas as a way for us to kind of focus our thinking about software development is a good thing in general. But I also agree that they become this kind of stereotype, apocryphal, again, placeholder for real humans. Um, so it's kind of like my, my view is somewhere in the middle. I think user stories and user-centered design is a great improvement. And I think one of the reasons why proprietary software is kicking our behinds um, because they are taking some of those approaches. Like I suspect that Slack has a very, very clear idea of who their users are and what their needs are and have probably spent some time thinking about that. On the other hand, I have seen them used very, very badly where they're kind of sketches and then it becomes this kind of dogma that, oh no, Betty, the librarian from, you know, is, is not going to be using our software so we don't need, you know, I don't know. But I think it's a good point that they're used badly, but I think we, it's probably a step overall in the right direction. Good question, Paul, thanks. Anyone else? Yes, Adam. So I guess both in open source and closed source develop, proprietary development, there's often a tension between you only have so many you know, person hours available to do work. And on the one hand, you might have some shiny feature that somebody really wants to implement um, or a product manager is screaming at you about. Or you could do work to improve a user experience or to, to simplify things. Do you have 
And that's often a tough battle to win if you're on the user side. Do you have techniques or tricks for kind of like trying to just nudge that back the other way? That is a great question, and I wish I did. Uh, do I have any tips or tricks to, to focus on improving UX over implementing the latest shiny feature that the, the client is calling for? I think we need to embrace usability and a user-focused approach as a kind of baseline gate for everything. It should be built in like accessibility. There are still people who don't do that, but in a perfect world, this stuff is part of the definition of done, effectively. That we have testing, that we have research up front, that we kind of understand where we're going from. But I think even more so, it's kind of like the ceiling of simplicity. Could we just make things easier by removing complexity? Can we, it's much harder, like people always say, you know, simple is the hardest thing to do. But I think that's where we need to focus our energy. So building that new shiny feature shouldn't happen unless that usability, it, there's a usability improvement in it as well. Not really answering your question, Adam, I'm sorry. Hey Donna, great talk. Hello. We love you. Um, my question is, and it may be controversial. Yes. Thank you. Should something fail a code review if the usability sucks? So I didn't quite hear that. Should something fail a code review if if the usability sucks, yes. But how do we test the usability? How do we, I mean, this is the thing, it's like, if we go back to the, you know, just brainiac me scratching my own itch, if we don't care to begin with, then no, right? But if we do care, and I think on the whole, we have a little bit more empathy and we would probably all like the world to be a better place. Okay, okay, I'm naive and optimistic and Pollyanna-ish about this, but yes, we should. Usability should be, um, should be good before that code review is accepted and merged. But then you knew I was going to say that. <laughs> there were a few other questions. I saw hands go up. Hey, Donna. Hey, Luke. Um, I, uh, the journey you were talking about um, trying to get more users to become contributors or even committers to projects, um, is there any kind of really good example you've seen or strategy that you know, open source projects can use to, to help people along that, that journey in particular? So I think there are a few. Um, the Drupal community in, um, expends a huge amount of effort in um, supporting mentors to hold uh, first patch um, workshops at DrupalCon. So we literally have like 600 people in a room the last day of the conference. Everyone's learning about the workflow and the process of how to, you know, because Drupal has a particularly special and arcane way of doing patches rather than the modern world of pull requests. Um, but there's a lot invested in that and it works really well. But I think Nadia also touched on it today. The first patch is kind of a good fun, you're supported through it. But what about the second and what about the tenth? The numbers of first patches versus tenth patches, that's that bit. So that's where I think we need to look at what Cathy Sierra is talking about and getting people over that I suck threshold as fast as possible, remove as much pain from that first contribution, value it, don't critique it too much, and then talk about, now that was great, could you maybe help with this? So I think there are some projects which are doing this really, really well. And Deb Nicholson, I'm not sure if she's in the audience, she's worked on Open Hub, I think, no, Open Hatch. Um, so I think that's one of those things where the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. Yeah, definitely some learning to be had. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, Wall usability is something that's, you know, obviously a responsibility for all developers. Um, how exactly, like, do you have any suggestions for how open source projects can attract people who have um, specialist background in stuff like user experience design and user research? A really good question and a, another one I can't really answer. Um, I think we've, I mean, I, I don't have enough broad experience across open source communities. It's probably one Leslie would have been able to answer better. I might call on Kat, might have some thoughts. but. One of the things that I know the Drupal community struggles with is getting diverse kinds of skills into the community. Like, we'll get developers, but we could really do with more designers and UX people and accessibility um, uh, experts. So there's a real challenge there. And I think there are 
There are also cultural issues in those different, perhaps, skill sets and professions that may not be open to the idea of sharing. They may come from a different background. So I think it's actually, you know, putting your finger on one of the challenges. Um, I wish I had a better answer. I know it's, it's something we need to find a way to do. Yeah. Any more questions? I, the other thought that I have here is that as well as sort of individualizing, we can learn a lot by remembering that there are a whole different, you know, people exist not just, you know, at one point, but at a whole, uh, like, firstly, on that graph, as a whole spectrum along the how much, how awesome I am, am I at this product, and how long I've, have I been using it, and a whole bunch of other dimensions. So I, I was, I guess, and your not a very is? good, not a very good question, but. I, I, I guess my question here is, can you think, what, what are the, sort of the axes that you think of when you're looking at the different dimensions of users? So, hu humanity comes in all shapes and sizes and that's where we need to start from. But I think the other piece the sort of, that you made me think of there is, when we kind of reduce our opinion to that users are stupid or that they're on some continuum about our tool, we're probably also forgetting that they might be you know, neuroscientists doing a thing and very smart, very switched on people with no time to tinker, fiddle and play with this thing to get, uh, you know, to basically deal with their, perhaps uh, process their data, right? They have very low tolerance for wasting time on trying to figure something out. Whereas perhaps we as geeks actually like to pull things apart and tinker and figure out how it works. And so that's why this reductionist stuff is so problematic. So there's different cognitive kind of uh, levels about the amount of attention you can pay at any given time. Then we've got our layer of ability, whether or not you're using assistive technologies, whether or not you're wearing glasses or not, and your you know, fine print is so fine that you, know, you can't read it. Um, there's a whole lot of different um, factors, age, language. Yesterday, the session of three people talking about how the challenges of being a non-English speaker, you know, there's so much stuff we build in, so many assumptions that we make, that I actually don't think there are, is an ax, you know, one axis. It's kind of, yeah, sorry. There's <laughs> a so question up the, ah, uh, two here and then one right up the back. Sorry, Ryan. Do you think that previous point maybe generalises out into just not having enough respect for other disciplines where we don't really appreciate how hard it is to teach children, practice law, or whatever. We have a very high opinion that we know something about our field and we don't appreciate that these people are very smart about other things and we don't have enough respect for their opinions based on that. Very much, very much agree. Respect, uh, respect and empathy, I think, are really keys to this and just stopping and being able to accept a different perspective. Um, is, is something we just could do more of generally, I guess, yeah, agreed. Sarah. So as a user, <laughs> how do I approach a developer without offending them to say that they need to make it a little bit more user friendly so I can use their product? So I think Pia had um, uh, a great example of this in her keynote the other day, which is rather than saying, this really sucks to, hey, here's a way that you could make it better. So if you can come with a solution, then that's probably the best approach. But I personally sometimes struggle with that. You know, I've been told, hey, Donna, you can, just, you can just contribute a patch and make this better. I'm like, yeah, I'd have to like, start my life 20 years ago and like, kind of to get the skills to do that. And also, you know, this is where, going back to the stupid users meme, yeah, sometimes I don't know what would make it better. I just know it's making me angry. <laughs> Right? But that's where I think that empathy and triage stuff comes in, that we go, someone is really struggling with this bit. Could we just look at it, maybe? I think Lana probably has some good um, experience and ideas on this. When you're writing technical documentation, you know a bit that's making people blow up. You go, hang on, right, OK. We need to scaffold this a little better. So good question, and again, one I can't answer effectively. Another question? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. 
So usability takes a lot of work to build in. Sorry, I, I can't hear you. Sorry, usability takes a lot of work to build in. It is very easy to damage. How do we break ourselves of the idea of change for change's sake? I don't know. <laughs> I agree. Like, usability is hard. It definitely is hard. But maybe I'm being unfair, but I kind of feel like it's in open source being it's hard and we don't care. It works for us. I'm okay with, you know, this arcane process. It, I, I don't even have to think about it. I don't have to scaffold. So I, I, I may be being unfair, and I, I know I am, but, you know. So there's an element of that. But I also think that um, there's, there's something we need to kind of address about that. I mean, let me rewind a bit. If, uh, I, I ran Linux Conf AU when it was in Melbourne many, many years ago and following the Sydney conference. And, and the Sydney team developed new software to run LCA. It was awesome. It was called Zookeeper. This is the first year we haven't used it. Now, there were some people on my team at the time who said, oh, no, we can write our own, because that was the kind of, uh, kind of pattern in the day that we'd just start again from scratch each year, which was foolish. But I got given Zookeeper all set up and ready to go. Like, OK, cool. So um, where's the admin page? Uh, what? <laughs> so how do, I, how do I use it? Oh, sorry, we didn't give you this text file which contains the SQL scripts you need to paste into here to get the reports. And I went, that's not going to be working for me. So poor old Yiri, who was our zookeeper keeper, actually wrote an admin page and put those scripts in such a way that I could actually run queries through a web browser. Voila, it was awesome. But it was just one of those things where it's like the people who wrote it wrote what they needed to do what they needed to do and not a step further. And that's why I have sympathy for the Just for Brainiac me. You know, sometimes that's all you need. You throw the code over the wall and if someone else can find it's useful, awesome, more power to them, they might make it better and send it back to you. Yay, job done. But what about if your community grows from two to five people to 2,000 to 5,000 to 50,000 people, or like Drupal, a million? Changes a bit, and you've got people who have different skills to bring to the table, and we want to adopt, we want to embrace them as contributors, and so they are designers and project managers, and goodness only knows what other kind of pigtail-wearing hippies, you know, that want to come and have really good skills to offer, but they're not going to be writing code or SQL queries. So again, I went off on a bit of a tangent there, but yes, usability is hard. I wish I had an answer. All right, we have. Take a step back, please. Thank you. Thank you for getting out of the danger zone. We have time for one more question. And going. Does nobody want Last to ask drinks. a question? Going. Going. Gone. Thank you all so Gone. much. One thing oh. I forgot. Thank you. Uh. <laughs> Thank you very much, Donna. And on behalf of the organizers, I'd like to offer you the speaker gift. Thank you so much, Ron. Lovely. And please put your hands together one last time for Donna. Thank you.